So first of all, who are you? Where are you actually from? Okay, well, I'm Sylvia Lindner. Uh, right. I'm originally from Austria, where I grew up. Okay. Um, but then uh, through a detour through Germany, ended up um, in the United States uh, mm -hmm. for my PhD in information and computer science. Mm -hmm. And that's also how I ended up in China. Okay. Because during my first year in grad school, I was part of a research team that was sponsored by Intel to study online gamers in wow. China. Um, because World of Warcraft at that time was really popular here. There was the single largest player group here in China. And so we worked with students at Beida, Peking University, and went into internet cafes, hung out with college kids who played the game. And that was sort of the moment for me where I became really interested also in technology design and production here in China because, you know, a lot of these kids, they did not just play World of Warcraft, they also designed their own game servers. They really, they were really unhappy with game censorship that the government had installed. So they got pirated version of the game from, you know, the shops, the markets um, in Beijing and set up their own game server. So it was all about hacking, you know, their own game and making their own game. And that's when I started my research here. Wow, ah, interesting. So, so so how did that transition to actually this environment, right? I mean, this is this is hacking of a different sort. Still the same, you know, same theme, right? Uh, right. But how did that how did that move to this? Okay. Well, so I came back to China in 2010 for my dissertation field work, and for that I was following a group of artists, bloggers, designers, and entrepreneurs who were working out of the co-working space Xindan Way. You might have heard about it. Mm -hmm. And um, that was a really fascinating time because this was, you know, where conversations evolved around openness and information freedom. And this all happened within this sort of like fairly informal space of co-working and event space. And um, people were meeting regularly on the weekends, but also in the evenings. Um, and so out of that co-working space actually emerged China's first hacker space. So this was where I met David Lee and Ricky and Min Lin, um, who also met there at a bar camp actually in, in the fall 2010. And that's where the first idea for DIY making in China and the first hacker space in China was born. So I was basically with them as a researcher when they started China's first hacker space. So it was literally a room in a co-working space when it all started. Mm -hmm. So this is a quite different space now. So it was, it was a room that had like a table in it with some Arduino boards, a 3D printer, mm -hmm. a couple of soldering irons. And they started by hosting a series of workshops um, that drew in a lot of people very quickly to introduce what could open hardware mean for China. And so within six months, the community had grown to such an extent that they moved into their own space, which was a different place in an old factory building, also in the downtown area of Shanghai. Um, and, but very quickly, like you could say about another year later, there were already about seven hacker spaces in China, Beijing, Zhenzhen, Hangzhou, um, there's like over 18 now. And so it has the, the sort of scene itself here in China grew very quickly. Um, and what happened at the same time, and which was very fascinating for me to follow as a researcher, was that um, it began intersecting with manufacturing. Mm. Mm. And it, now obviously, you know, Chinese, the Chinese have dominated the manufacturing market for the last, what, 30 years, 40 years, right? Um, do you think that they're, well, it's pretty obvious that they're sort of uniquely positioned to be able to take advantage of those resources or those assets that they currently have. Do you think there are other assets that they have that uh, that sort of uniquely uh, uniquely position them? I mean, obviously, you know, access to components that we've never heard of and and uh, pricing that you know we could we could hope to get um, these sorts of things. But through your research and through exploring with with uh, exploring how things are actually built over here. If you come across anything that's sort of like, ah, okay, you know, this is this is one of those things that's gonna define uh, that that's that's gonna open up opportunities here that don't exist elsewhere. Right, so um, I had the amazing opportunity to actually be down in Shenzhen, in the southern part of China, in Guangdong province, for about half a year. And I don't know if you've been to Shenzhen, but that question sort of finds an immediate answer, actually, when you go there. So Shenzhen, in many ways, is a a vast manufa manufacturing ecosystem, as you were saying. You know, it's a long history of outsourcing, ODMs, and so on. 
But what has happened as well in Shenzhen is that they're developed over sort of the last 10 to 20 years a very informal, very agile network of small scale manufacturing houses that has grown, that have grown in scale quite quite big, that work alongside sort of these much more well known um, factories like Foxconn, for example. So what they have been doing is, you know, they started off very small but started collaborating and openly sharing some of their sources, for example, the bill of materials. Um, and this is very unique in the manufacturing sort of business, right? So in many ways, um, they have developed an open source system that is quite compatible with a sort of the maker and open hardware industry, so to say. So by doing that, by openly sharing, for example, where do they get the quality and good components, um, by using discarded phones that had still usable components, they were able to actually create new and innovative devices. And this whole scene and whole process, you might have heard that term before, is also called Zhanjai. So Zhanjai literally stands for mountain fortress, which has sort of this Robin Hood connotation of like the, the poor taking from the rich by sort of these Zhanjai vendors, you know, taking old discarded phones from big names um, and using the, the still working parts to basically design new phones. So the phone, the Shanghai phones have been one of the sort of most well-known innovations that has come out of that out of that region. It's, for example, dual SIM card phones or phones uh, designed for migrant populations who cannot afford, you know, the latest iPhone 5, you know, but it's a huge market. So, so this is a, a fascinating sort of ecosystem of its own that has begun intersecting also with the maker movement. So, for example, hardware startups that come now to Shenzhen um, through accelerator programs, being funded by Kickstarter, you know, um, they actually have, you know, hardware ideas um, being funded that they actually then need to implement. So that's why they come in part, you know. To, to China, um, but in doing that, they, they intersect with that sort of very much so aligned that maker culture spirit, you know, that sort of grew out of necessity. Sort of, sure. these were people who started to make a living, you know, by doing that. Interesting. So, so, you know, historically, there's been so much, so much attention paid to people from the outside trying to crack the code on China. Mm. Uh, less attention on the Chinese trying to crack the code on making and hacking and whatnot. And, and one of the one of the dimensions of that, you know, historically Chinese engineers have been seen as service providers. So they would receive a series of instructions and they would execute those instructions. Uh, but the younger generation of Chinese engineers has obviously uh, got much more interest in being creative, right, and being able to contribute to the design side of things rather than being simply recipients of a set of instructions and then executing on that or costing things down and finding unique and sort of innovative ways to manufacture it for less money more emphasis on the actual creation of products, right, and the, the origins of new products, right? Mi Phone is a great example, right? I mean, Xiaomi is, 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 you know, has done a great job building their own televisions and their own telephones and building a tremendous brand, right? Something that's, right. that's got brand recognition inside of China right. that didn't come from Japan or didn't come from Germany or didn't come from the U.S., right? Um, the intersection of those things seems particularly interesting. And I guess the question there is, is um, how do you see that actually that that transition occurring right now because I think you know having having hired engineers in China uh, and having had engineers working on my team uh, many of them were looking for opportunities to be inspired to build things to be creative to sort of let go of the very prescriptive side of things and instead be be empowered to be creative and to uh, to show off their skills and that you know that transcends blogging it transcends Social media transcends uh, open source and open hardware, uh, which are sort of the ultimate proof points of my capacity uh, to deliver. So, so I guess characterize kind of what that transition is look is looking like and how that actually cuts across then into the makerspace and the hackerspace and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So you're asking in particular the transition that's happening on the Chinese side, right? So I mean, yeah, I think, so. I think a, a particular interesting example, and you might have heard of that company already, Seed Studio. Mm -hmm. So uh, Seed Studio grew out in many ways of that sort of unique manufacturing ecosystem in Shenzhen, right? So Eric Pan started that business in 2008, and it's similar to Arduino, you know, it's a business that designs and manufactures open hardware platforms for the maker community. Um, but Seed Studio has the unique advantage that it's actually in Shenzhen, right? So it has access to the same kind of like you know, sourcing houses and design houses that openly share the materials if you're actually part of that informal network of Shanghai produ producers. 
And so they're able, you know, to um, develop and implement an agile manufacturing process that's right inside the design house. So design and manufacturing sits very closely together and they're innovating very fast um, within sort of that open hardware domain as well. But they're like sitting also in between, right? So they Seed basically can speak a language that's both uh, communicating to makers mm -hmm. and hardware startups that come from abroad, you know. Mm -hmm. It's also offering services for these for these types of companies, for example, right? And speaks the system of the Shenzhen manufacturing ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. So why I'm pointing out to Seed is also this is not the story, the success story of this Chinese American who came back to China, you know, or the Chinese who went abroad and studied at Harvard and came back. But Eric actually grew up in Shenzhen, uh, in, in Sichuan province, you know, and started this as his own business. And the real drive behind Seed Studio is also to remake what manufacturing in China means today. So if you actually look at the Seed Studio um, products, they have, um, as any sort of electronic product or end consumer product has a label on them, but it doesn't say made in China or assembled in China and you know created in California. It actually says innovate, innovated with China. And that is a, is a really important sort of like shift in what I see a lot of the, the younger maker, Chinese maker startups uh, pushing forward as well to really change and remake that image that China is just this place that's made in, you know, where people, other people from elsewhere come and have the creative ideas and then make something here, you know, because somebody sure. is making it for them here. Sure, sure. Well, it's so, so now, now obviously Seed Studio has, has, has sort of position themselves as uh, as a semi-premium brand, right? I mean, there's their, their price point certainly for, for m many of the things that they're doing puts them outside of the range of a traditional production product, right? Uh, to transitioning from Seed Studio to a production product requires openness, right? It requires the ability to take their schematic and find a way to cost it down and build that into, into my own system. Um, but there are a lot of other companies here which are disrupting uh, the traditional notion of sort of openness here. Um, and, and openness globally, right? Historically, Broadcom, Marvell, have been very restrictive in access to the internals of their chips, very restrictive in access to their source code and things like that. But then you look at a company like Spreadtrum, who's providing source code available for download from their website, and it represents a, a, a massive shift in thinking, particularly around communications hardware, uh, which is one of those that, that historically has been the most restrictive, the, the most limited of access, because it tends to go to the mobile providers. Um, do you see that 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 sort of explosion in openness uh, as a as a strategic move on the part of these companies in China that that sort of deliberately coming from a sense of well if the other guys aren't making it available and we make it available we we position ourselves to be consumed more easily. Uh, and to be designed in more effectively or more, you know, more efficiently than something else where I might need an NDA or I might need to be a Nokia to get access to that device or be a you know, friend of Qualcomm at some level to get access to that. Well, I think it's much more pragmatic than it is strategic. And I think this is also shifting right now, right? Um, so I think there's a real pragmatism to sort of like, how can we actually be competitive, you know? And there was the realization that competitive you know, being competitive might mean to actually collaborate mm -hmm. to a certain degree and uh, form alliances and partnerships, you know, rather than going closed source or, or staying closed. Um, I do think, though, that in terms of like that attitude, you know, which was much more sort of this sort of perhaps, you know, David Lee, for example, calls it a sort of like out of necessity um, kind of uh, open approach. Um, is shifting though right now, and this is and this is going to be more more. So we will going to see more of that, I think. So as you know. Hardware startups are coming to Zhenzhen and other parts of China, for example, and are intersecting with these small to mid-sized manufacturing houses, um, or even bigger players. I mean, Foxconn is paying attention, you know. Uh, there's going to be more strategic rearrangement within sort of the Chinese manufacturing side towards, okay, wh what, is, what is this sort of open hardware movement, you know, what, what could this be a new customer base? And you see, you know, you see that happening sort of on a really big scale by, you know, Intel coming out with the Galileo board, for example, you know, yeah. and so on. So, so you see broader attention towards towards open hardware from the bigger players in manufacturing as well. Well, it's interesting the direction, you know, low-cost communications transceivers, right? It's a great example of one of those places where there's potential for huge opportunity uh, of designed 
in China for China, mm -hmm. where in China we're experiencing you know the, the largest mass urbanization in human history, right? And through that process, the challenges that we normally attribute to uh, to this concept of IoT, uh, or the you know the opportunities that we normally attribute to, to a concept like IoT. Uh, and communications hardware and communications technology and being able to, to link together these various systems and be able to, to organize ourselves um, in, in new and sort of novel ways. That, that's happening, but nowhere, is it ha nowhere are the benefits of that sort of technology so obvious as they are in China. And I guess uh, that, that trend towards uh, designed in China for China seems to have real teeth in, in, in the sense that, that you know, here's, here's an opportunity for Chinese engineers to actually build products inside of China and even small startups to start to form around some of these technology issues. Um, it, I guess in this community of, of more entrepreneurial than probably purely the maker notion, but, but more at the entrepreneurial level, do you see a lot of companies sort of formulating in China around those sorts of concepts and those sorts of those, those sorts of challenges and those sorts of technologies that that uh, that target specifically the Chinese market. Sure. Yeah, I think you see that a lot, and I think you see that with any sort of startup kind of and maker community that there's a real sort of effort to localize and uh, what they are doing, right, and sort of like address local concerns. So what you see a lot here is, for example, people trying to think about, okay, how could we work around issues of sustainability and healthy living and, you know, thinking about the impacts the pollution has and how, you know, a hardware startup, for example, could help with that in terms of sensors and, you know, measuring and integrating that into sort of wearable devices and smart home sort of initiatives that are really focused on, you know, these applications that make sense in China, like tracking where your food is coming from, you know, sure. or so on and so forth. So um, you see definitely sort of an effort towards, you know, shaping and designing products that have a local impact here mm -hmm. and speak particularly to to consumers also in China. I think there's a real passion behind this. You know, I feel like there's almost sort of this a little bit of an idealistic approach towards making the world a better place. Mm -hmm. So I feel like a lot of the startups here are less sort of um, strategic about, oh, what is the next big customer segment and the next big market in China? You know, they're very idealistic in sort of this, how can we make China a better place and by doing that make the world a better place? Um, it was also really interesting to see how sort of the startups that come out of different regions are different. So um, I've spent some time with Chinese startups also in the, in the Shenzhen region and some time with startups here in Shanghai. And the ones in Shenzhen um, really describe that region as a place that's um, conducive of what they're doing. So some of them would even call it the Silicon Valley of China, that it has a certain openness to it. And that breeds also certain ideas for product development. Right. So there's a certain people understand that region. There is a certain freedom of exploration is removed from the capital. Right. So people there would describe that their goal is also to just tinker and play and explore more free, freely rather than, you know, targeting like the market directly, you know, even though they are targeting the market directly by designing products. But that would be sort of the philosophy. Right. Yeah. So, so what's the leap like from maker and hacker in China to entrepreneur? I mean, what, what, what does that actually look like? And, 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 and have characterized how that's actually changed uh, in the time that you've been here. Um, well, I, th I also think that this is very sort of location specific. So what you see here in uh, Xinjiang, for example, this is a really a real sort of hacker space of tinkering and play. Um, and there's a couple of startups, you know, that, um, you know, that are members of the hackerspace. Um, but I wouldn't say that Xinjiang has a model where it's incubating these startups, right? So, and there's a lot of discussion around that within the community, versus you've seen, for example, the hackerspace in Beijing change quite rapidly, drastically into a makerspace. So that functions much more like an incubator program that really is there to, um, uh, to bring out new startups and to provide funding for them or at least connect them to funding options, right? You see with that, you know, a certain maturation mm -hmm. of sort of the maker community here. Um, 
you might almost say there is a move happening from hacking to making, which I think is not unique to China. You see this sort of on on a global scale, you know, of like Makeabot being born out of NYC Resistor in New York, you know, now, in be, now being a company that was bought, you know, for hundreds of millions of dollars, you know. So I think you see that more broadly, but you also see it here in China, you know, that there is sort of a move happening from this, it's just play and tinkering and something we do on the weekends and it's just for fun into, no, this actually could be a way of living and this, we could, yeah, doing a startup is actually something that we could, that could be a form of life and working in China. And you have to understand that this is really something more radical in China than it is in the United States and in Europe, for example. When you think about family structures here, you know, where there's a lot of sort of aversion against risk taking, where people are trying to find a stable job, you know, in a big corporation that's associated with stability and provide sort of like structure and, and support for the family you know and there is there's a lot of discouragement of, of the older generation you know for young people to be like you know sort of risk takers and, and so being an entrepreneur here is something much more radical and so making that step actually from it's just a place of tinkering and play to oh this is also an entrepreneurial practice that has been a somewhat radical move here and something that has happened over the last three years here which, which is interesting to see you know well, so, so on that note, you know, when I, when I would ask engineers who were interviewing with me, mm -hmm. um, why did you go into engineering? The, 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 the sort of tongue-in-cheek answer, though kind of bitter pill, I guess, was, well, that's, you know, that's, that's kind of what was prescribed for me, right? That's what the test dictated, right? So as you graduate high school and you're preparing to go off to university, you know, it's one of these where, where university programs tend, tended to, certainly historically, be much more prescribed. You know, you are going to go off and be an engineer because on this scale there are three or four different opportunities that you qualify for, and this is the highest paying. And, you know, there's, there, there's, uh, there's an altruistic motive behind that, too, which is how do I take care of my family? How do I raise a family? How do I ensure that I have money enough to pay for my parents as they start to age and these sorts of things. So, you know, there's, there's, there's a negative, there, there, there may be a negative in there, but there's a, there's a huge positive in there that people tend to understate mm. uh, that comes from the, the cultural difference of being very sort of family oriented and, and that sort of thing. Do you think China has suffered from that? Um, and that, uh, that, you know, certainly in the West, when somebody goes into engineering, we have this story of the sort of bootstrapped from you know, I was seven, eight, nine years old, mm -hmm. started programming on a Commodore PET in my parents' basement, and, you know, this, that, and everything, and that story sort of evolves over mm -hmm. the course of somebody's life, and it's very obvious that this person is going to evolve into this thing. Mm -hmm. um, where here, it's sort of, you know, I've gotten to be 18 years old, and now it's time for me to pick a career. What's going to be the most lucrative and the most, you know, the thing that's, that's going to... to uh, to create the most opportunity and wealth and, and security for my family. Do you think China has suffered from that? And do you think that, that, uh, that they're going through a shift in their thinking about those sorts of things? Uh, and, and how has that actually impacted the, the early childhood education, and specifically you know, primary school all the way through high school? Um, do you think that there's an impact yet at that level that says, hey, maybe we need to be encouraging kids to build more things and play with more things and to, to uh, encourage them in, in, in certain areas where their interests. I think you certainly see a shift happening on multiple fronts. And the question is how, how sort of widespread or how big the scale of that is. But, you know, sort of just a couple of examples to, to sort of answer that. So... Um, universities, for example, in China are opening up maker spaces and hacker labs, you know, similar to what is happening in the United States, for example. So Tsinghua has, has, you know, a big, I think they call it a maker lab or innovation lab set up. And I'm at the School of uh, Computer Science here at Fudan, and they're in the process right now of opening up a, a hacker space with, within the social computing lab there. Um, but then you also see, so David took me, and this was about a year ago, to a makerspace for children mm -hmm. that was actually sponsored by the Chinese government as one of the, the so-called um, innovation houses, um, which was, I don't know if you heard about this, in 2011, the Shanghai government announced to build 100 innovation houses mm -hmm. 
so called hackerspaces as innovation houses. Mm -hmm. um, and this was sort of modeled a little bit after Xin Zhijian or after they visited Xin Zhijian. So it was quite interesting to see how that materialized as this maker space for children. So we went there um, and it actually has these miniature machines that are, that, you know, that children can use how to make things, you know. And so I, I do think you see sort of a reorientation happening towards and a realization happening, oh, actually, you know, making things is something that could be part of our educational system and that's actually a site of innovation, right? Literally, the, the, the Shanghai government called it innovation house, right? Um, I do think there is a lot of opportunity to, to scale that up. You know, this is, this, these are like small efforts that are sort of like here and there. Um, I think, you know, I mean, David, for example, is doing a lot in sort of the educational space, you know, like, for example, teaching children at the Shanghai Library. So I think it, a lot of individuals are, you know, trying to make that shift happen. But I think what is really needed is policy change, you know, it's like governmental institutions on a bigger scale getting involved in that and supporting that, you know, to really allow sort of more broader institutional change for schools, for example. Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, so you want to just like to some question about like Shanghai in particular and like local scene? Uh, yeah, sorry, argument. sorry. We're talking about big political issues. Okay. <laughs> now, now we need to now we need to, to bring it down to planet Earth, I guess. Uh -huh. um, okay. So, so yeah. I guess uh, I'm not I'm not good at the small. No, no, it's good, it's good. But you know, we should you know get something about uh, you know how to feel about Shanghai and uh, technology scene and maybe art and where all that intersects. And mm, okay. What does living in Shanghai you know look like? Okay. Someone, you know? Okay. Well. I love Shanghai. It's my favorite city in the world. Um, <laughs> I've been here now for like about four years um, and, you know, wrote most of my dissertation about what is happening here in the creative scene, bottom up creativity, you know, so I think Shanghai is interesting because it comes with sort of um, history, you know, that people are both uh, trying to incorporate into sort of the urban fabric and also trying to distance themselves from. So when you think about the 1930s sort of um, colonial period, you know, that's definitely shaping the urban landscape here in Shanghai, but that's being reincorporated into into sort of like new spaces here in Shanghai. So when you think about the creative cluster boom that started after China entered the WTO in 2001. So but what this meant was basically that there was a series of new regulations that allowed urban developers to turn old factory buildings, you know, or old houses into these new cool creative cluster environments that, you know, where for example art studios when, you know, moved in there, architecture spaces and so on. So I think Shanghai in that sense um, has sort of incorporated the past mm -hmm. into its remaking of mm -hmm. the present and the future, if you want to say that, right? So it, it's been a fascinating um, sort of transition to witness. Um, and that started, of course, way before I sort of came here. But it's something that I found truly fascinating, you know, and, and, and there's certainly also that comes baggage with that. You know, it's very hard for the younger generation to actually intersect with that, right? Um, so this has been sort of a passion for me as a foreigner. It's um, it's sometimes easier to get access to certain things, you know, because people are curious about you, you know. So I see myself as somebody who can actually bridge between, you know, what is happening sort of on the more large scale development space, you know, and younger people, you know, since I'm at, I am at Fudan and work with younger people there as well, you know, so helping them get access to some of these, you know, some of these get access into some of these spaces and scenes that are usually for like the bigger corporates, you know. So a lot of the creative clusters ended up housing, you know, very well-known design firms like IDEO, for example, or Frog, you know. And you know, for example, Xinjiang is not at a creative industry cluster, right? It's very, it's fairly expensive to be there. Mm -hmm. So how can you connect actually what has happened in Shanghai on a fairly sort of administrative level, you know, sort of which was um, orchestrated by, you know, through policy regulation, you know, redesigning the urban fabric, you know, how can you connect that to these really creative bottom-up spaces like Xin Zhijian? So that, that would be something that is really interesting mm -hmm. to explore further. Cool. Did you want more in Shanghai? I don't why know. Why should no. everyone move to Shanghai? No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that should be the last one. Okay, well, Shanghai is the coolest city in the world um, because it has both sides. So it has a lot of creativity. Mm -hmm. It has connected to uh, a 30 year long history of manufacturing and making. Um, I love David's term for that. It's sort of hacking and making with Chinese characteristics. <laughs> and I think David should maybe elaborate more what that means. Um, but Shanghai is basically that hybrid, which makes it so fascinating.
Cool. Thanks, Lord. Awesome.